Okay, I think we're uh, ready for our next session. And uh, this one's titled, to make sure you're again in the right place, uh, Keeping the UP, uh, the UP Wild. And uh, the two presenters, uh, first is uh, Tyler Barron, and uh, he's a policy advocate for the Environmental Law and Policy Center working on Midwest climate change and clean energy solutions and uh, Great Lakes natural resources protection advocate, advocacy issues. He served as a, a Udall Foundation uh, Native Congressman fellow in the office of uh, Raul Grijalva uh, and is a policy fellow at the Cook County Department of Human Rights and Ethics. He's cur he currently serves as co-chair of the University of Chicago Harris uh, School's alumni chapter of Chicago and helps advise current Harris School and University of Notre Dame students on how to impact, how to make an impact on the world of sustainability. Uh, just a little after uh, thought here, he enjoys Notre Dame football, lacrosse, and working uh, with the uh, L ELPC team. And uh, Paul Dolling uh, is a media relations uh, specialist at ELPC, building public awareness and, and uh, of and improving informed media coverage for climate change and clean energy issues. Most recently, the editor of Chicago Lawyer Magazine. Uh, he joined ELPC following award-winning career in journalism, uh, focused on science writing, legal, the legal industry, and Illinois politics. He's also a former journalist adjunct at Loyola University Chicago. His work appeared in publications, uh, including Chicago Tribune, Chicago Sun-Times, Chicago Reader, and uh, other, uh, other publications. So uh, not to take up their time, uh, Tyler and Paul, you're on. I do have my bell, the ever-present bell. Uh, as we get close to the end, I'll ring it so you know you have about five minutes, uh, five minutes to go. And I will also have a question and answer period uh, connected with this. Okay. Awesome. Can everyone hear me okay? Can I confirm that being remote? No, anyone? Yes. yes, we can hear you. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so my colleague, Paul, uh, is unfortunately going to have to miss this session. He had something come up with his uh, family. So I hope that I'm a decent stand in for Paul. Uh, it's a little weird kind of staring. Oh, there we go. Now we're zooming out. So I have, a, I can actually talk to an audience. That's great. Um, so, <laughs> so I, uh, like, uh, like our great introduction said, my name is Tyler Barron. I'm a policy advocate with the Environmental Law and Policy Center. So we are a Midwest-based and Midwest-focused nonprofit environmental advocacy firm. Uh, we focus on the green stuff and here to talk to you about a project that we've been working on since the spring of 2019. So um, we have been exploring this for the better part of two and a half years to designate three new areas and add additional acreage to uh, an existing wilderness area. So we're looking to designate three new areas in Ontonagon County. They are currently a part of the Ottawa National Forest, and we're looking to add additional acreage to the Sturgeon River Gorge Wilderness Area, which is in Houghton County. Um, right now, there are probably a less than a dozen areas left in the Midwest that would still qualify under the Wilderness Act and be what we call palatable. So able to actually move through Congress in a way that allows them to be designated as wilderness. And right now, Michigan, in our opinion, has three of those. So um, Michigan has 16 current wilderness areas. So the state is not allergic to protecting special natural places by this means. Um, and what we think, in our opinion, is that we need to focus on providing the necessary protections to these areas and then move on to equally important things in other realms. And um, when Congress 
moved to designate a large grouping of wilderness areas in the past in the uh, John Dingle Act of 2019, it designated about 2.3 million acres of new federal wilderness. And those areas were really all over the country. They were in Louisiana and Arkansas. I believe there were some in Utah, some in California. And our question very quickly became, where's the Midwest? And it turns out that there was a larger appetite for the state of Michigan to do this sooner than a number of other Midwest states. And so us and our Michigan partners have focused on Michigan and how we can ultimately get this done. And we've heeded advice from Senator Stabenow's office, Senator Peter's office, as well as Representative Bergman's office on what exactly is the easiest way to do something like this. And the message here has been pretty consistent that the easiest way to do this is you cast a really wide net and you build out a big and broad tent of support so that this is something easier for them to ultimately say yes to, right? It's politicking 101. It's easier to support things that are popular. And so um, we have been very conscious about building a diverse, but also a large coalition of support. So our first priority here when we were starting out was what I guess you would consider the broader Michigan environmental community, as well as the tribes, especially the three Western Upper Peninsula tribes who uh, have existing treaty rights in these areas, which would be Hannaville, KBIC, and uh, Lac Vitezere. Um, I think having had success in those areas, we've branched out to kind of the broader business community, religious community, student groups who might be interested in something like this. And that coalition of support continues to become more diverse as our support continues to grow. So we recently passed 125 groups supporting this now. This would already be the biggest wilderness push uh, uh, in the in the state's history, but we're going to continue to grow that to make this, like I said, an easier yes for those elected officials that ultimately will decide whether or not something like this happens. Um, we are operating under a fairly soft timeline for something like this. When it comes to designating wilderness, it's always a little bit fluid. Um, a lot of it depends on congressional timing, and so um, we there's not necessarily a hard stop for when we would have to introduce something like this. Wilderness has moved through Congress pretty much like any other piece of legislation. And so um, it's really just a matter of when the yeses are there and when the noes aren't. And so um, I think that might be all that I have to say about it. I would love to you know, answer any questions or comments that anyone may have. And um, you know, if, before we do that, if I could just get a clarification on how much time we have for that so I could keep an eye on the clock too, that would also be great. So you know, really great to, to see everyone. Thank you all for coming and thank you for listening to me. Okay, I would I would like to make a, just make a comment, but uh, a friend of mine did a study of the amount of land uh, in the Upper Peninsula, and that is uh, been kept in that is available to the public. A lot of times we hear that the land is owned by various private uh, corporations, et cetera, et cetera, and it was found that. A, I forget the 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 exact amount, but there is a tremendous amount of Upper Peninsula property that is available for the uh, for public use, and so what you're doing is just adding to that uh, to that uh, uh, process that's been going on for a long time. Um, not really advertised, you know, and and people don't really realize it, and I think a lot of people feel that. The uh, the land is uh, is all privately owned and unavailable. But uh, as you go around the UP, you find there's huge huge areas, and a lot of it really developed. We had a number of of small national forests. I know there was a Marquette National Forest, which was uh, a small operation in the eastern Upper Peninsula by Sault Ste. Marie, and then that was. Uh, 
greatly expanded during the uh, the New Deal, when uh, a lot of these uh, forest areas uh, were just kind of sitting there. The the lumber companies had made their money uh, in the process uh, and were just sitting on the land, but they couldn't pay taxes or didn't want to pay taxes because it was kind of worthless land, and they um, oh, uh, worthless for them. And so the federal government took it over, and that's how we had the great expansion of uh, the um, Hiawatha National Forest in the eastern UP and the uh, Ottawa National Forest in in the uh, in the western UP. And then since that time, there's been a, a constant uh, expansion over the years, bit by bit, as as various areas have been uh, uh, turned into state parks and and expanded. Uh, federal properties and so on. So this is uh, very good to hear this uh, this development and the work that you're uh, you're doing. Uh, could you tell us a little about maybe uh, what it what has been done? I've kind of <laughs> talked about the UP. Uh, what what do we have in terms of the the uh, the lower lower peninsula uh, area? Okay, are there wilderness areas down there? Yeah. So I think. Um... I think that your point is well taken and and just to reiterate so these the areas that we're looking to designate here are already existing Ottawa National Forest so they're already public lands. Uh, you can only designate federal wilderness from federal lands and so this this really has nothing to do with private property, which therefore means that it doesn't have anything to do with you know pilt funding or anything like that as well. So just to reiterate that point. Um, the the mitten does have a couple wilderness areas. Um, it's a little bit trickier to uh, designate areas in the mitten just by the way that uh, the mitten has been really built over the years. Um, there's a strict set of criteria that's laid out in the Wilderness Act, and it's a bit of a quid pro quo in order to designate an area as wilderness. So wilderness is really the highest level of protection that the federal government can afford a natural place. And in order to do that, I think that the trade-off here was that you really have to find places that are special and unique and biodiverse enough to ultimately give that level of protection. And so um, really the, the first criteria would be on size. So an area has to be 5,000 acres or bigger or special enough to justify that level of protection in order to be designated. There's a limitation on what it's allowed to basically be next to. So something has to meet a certain serene quality. You can't put a wilderness area next to a federal highway, for instance, or a noisy suburb. And then it also has to provide kind of ample opportunity for exploration and outdoor activity. And so just again, by the way that the mitten was built up, there's really not that much space that would qualify under the Wilderness Act. And so we end up having a couple areas there, but most of the wilderness in the state of Michigan is in the Upper Peninsula just by how the Upper Peninsula is, is situated to, to ultimately meet that criteria. Uh, could, could you just add to the uh, your comments about the wilderness area? Uh, that means that you cannot have uh, vehicles. Uh, you can only go into the area on foot. And can you camp in the area? Could, could you explain some of that? Uh, sure. Yeah, so the, the big limitation here is that you're not allowed to take anything motorized into a wilderness area. Um, the, the reason why we talked about kind of a two, side, two sides of the same coin here when it came to choosing areas, right? Choosing areas that would, number one, meet the criteria of the Wilderness Act, and number two, be palatable, where we knew that they would have a chance making sure that we affect it as little as possible while also providing the protections necessary to these areas was really the biggest uh, consideration for us. And there were a number of areas with fairly major motorized thoroughfares, especially ATV and snowmobile trails that we just got rid of right away, right? Understanding the importance of those two communities uh, and those, you know, those two modes of transportation in the Upper Peninsula was really something that we didn't want to mess with. 
And so the areas that we've picked here don't have any major ATV snowmobile trails. They're really hardly frequented at all by motorized traffic to begin with. One of the uh, retired wilderness rangers that we've worked with on this project who was actually in these areas for most of his 40 year career made the joke that if he saw more than a couple ATVs or snowmobiles a year that he would probably consider calling the FBI because something weird was going on in there. And so we felt pretty good that by designating these areas and ultimately, you know, just by virtue of designating them, limiting that motorized use, that we really wouldn't be affecting anything. And so historically, those ATV and snowmobile crowds in the Upper Peninsula have been very opposed to wilderness designations, but we haven't really gotten that level of pushback because we're not we're not kind of intruding on their space, and that was very much on purpose. And so, um, in terms of what you are not allowed to do in the area, that's really the the big thing here. Um, logging would also just not be allowed right off the bat mining as well. And so those are really the three, the three big things um, for us. In terms of what you can do in there, our focus here has been on really protecting current usage above all else. So you will still be able to, to hunt in there. We're not putting any bait restrictions or munitions restrictions there. You'll still be able to fish in there, canoe, hike, backpack, bird watch, uh, leave no trace camping will still be allowed, right? Anything that's allowed by uh, by the DNR and other Michigan agencies currently, we're not going to put additional restrictions on there in the legislative language. So there are areas, uh, wilderness areas that have written in additional restrictions, but we have no intention on doing that and frankly don't want to, right? The, these areas are meant to be enjoyed by by people. They're meant to be gone into and, and uh, explored and, and that's how we wanna keep them. Do we have any other question? I was curious uh, in regard to the Sturgeon Gorge area, are you talking about expanding that wilderness area upstream or downstream? Yeah, so it would be uh, kind of on the middle to slightly lower middle western part of the Sturgeon River Gorge. So it's about a 2000 acre addition um, uh, and it's mainly Kind of a wetlands it's got a river running through it it's a large beaver population um but yeah i would say middle to lower middle west part of that area i'm wondering on a, on a national basis you know with the change of administration uh things took place uh, particularly with respect to um, um national monuments Mm -hmm. uh, any any changes with respect to uh, the management of wilderness uh, at the federal level from previous administration to the current one? Um, yeah, it's a really great question. Uh, we we haven't gotten any indication that there'll be a major change uh, from from an administrative level. However, you know each wilderness area that gets designated gets its own wilderness management plan, and so ultimately we want to make sure that that management plan allows these areas to you know, maintain the, those wilderness protections, but also address any, you know, concerns that that ultimately exist in there, whether it's fire or invasive species, you know, anything like that. And so um, while the new administration might not have major changes to wilderness management, we get to ultimately, you know, dig in with Congress and, and, uh, and the Forest Service on how to, on how to develop those individual management plans. How about logging in wilderness areas? Uh, I, I highly doubt that that'll change, right? That's that's a base tenant of the Wilderness Act. And, and so I, I very much doubt that that'll change anytime soon. I had a question um, about your um, environmental law and policy center that you said focused on the Midwest. Do you co work with and coordinate uh, with uh, Earth Justice? I mean, that's a more national mm. sort of um, an environmental policy center that I'm, I'm more familiar with, I guess. Right. I, yeah, I, I know. Um, yeah, it it it's project dependent. I would say, right? We we work with a lot of different stakeholders from project to project. But I do know on on certain projects in the past, and uh, uh, we we definitely have worked with them. I'm not sure on any current projects if if we're working with them or not. Okay, and then the second is, uh, uh, do you get involved with something like the Line Five fight? I mean, 
that's an awfully big project here in the um, in the Midwest, over Midwest about are we going to be able to save uh, the Great Lakes from an oil spill? Correct. Yeah. So so our office, just for full transparency, is is a main filer with Governor Whitmer's office against Line Five. We've we've been working with her office against Line Five since since she was sworn in. Okay, I have, I'm back with, with a question. Uh, sometimes we have a lot of interaction with Northern Wisconsin. Are there any uh, wilderness areas in Northern Wisconsin kind of bordering the Upper Peninsula? The, uh, there are, yes. Uh, I, I probably wouldn't be able to name a whole lot of them. Uh, the Apostle Islands, I know, is, is pretty close to the border there. Um, that was recently designated as wilderness. I know that there, there are a, a number of areas, obviously, in the northern part of Wisconsin because it has areas that, that would qualify under the Wilderness Act. Um, I'm not in I think Wisconsin has 12 uh, wilderness areas, so still a pretty healthy number. And, um, and, and I'm trying to visualize the the Wisconsin wilderness map that I should have in my head and, and I think most of them are are in that northern part or kind of northwestern part of the state. Okay, any final final questions for you? The speaker. Okay, well, thank you for your, uh, your presentation and uh, the highlight, again, we have uh, the presenter highlighting some of the developments that are taking place, again, in the Upper Peninsula and uh, items that we're quite uh, interested in and concerned about. So thank you and thank you for your work. Awesome, thank you, everyone. I really appreciate it. And um, if I could just say one last thing, if anybody wants to just, you know, kind of check this project out some more, or learn more about it, we have a, a project website for this. It's called keeptheupwild.com, keeptheupwild.com. So if anybody wants to learn more, uh, my email's on there. I'm always happy to answer any more questions as, uh, as well. So feel free to shoot me a message and happy to talk. So thank you guys so much. Really appreciate it. Okay, our uh, next presentation is going to be uh, in place in house here. Uh, and this is kind of, uh, I've been, uh, I, I was on the, uh, on the program last year, the 2020 program, we did it through Zoom and uh, uh, we're kind of slow, you can see us slowly working back to uh, normal times pre, uh, pre 2020. Uh, so our next presentation, uh, is titled uh, Stop the Rocket, and the presenter is uh, Dennis uh, Ferraro, and a little about his background, he is a retired trial lawyer now serving as vice chairman of the Marquette Township Planning Commission, uh, is a founding member and current president of Citizens for Safe and Clean Lake Superior, nonprofit, nonprofit citizens group formed to protect Lake Superior's coastal habitat, and dedicated to stopping the construction of an industrial rocket launch site on the beautiful shoreline near uh, Tony, Tony Point at Granite Loma. So I think some of you have heard uh, bits and pieces about this, uh, but today we'll kind of get a, uh, uh, some direct insights into what is happening and what uh, possibly could happen. Okay, Dennis. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Russ, for the introduction, and uh, good morning to all of you. Uh, <clears throat> as Russ has indicated, my name is Dennis Ferraro. I'm the president of a local uh, group of citizens who have formed a nonprofit 
uh, dedicated generally to the mission of helping preserve, I forgot, I'm supposed to take this off, helping preserve and protect uh, the coastal habitat of Lake Superior here in Marquette County. And in particular, as Russ alluded to, are, we are dedicated to stopping and preventing a project that proposes to construct a heavy industrial commercial rocket launch site on a beautiful pristine stretch of shoreline about 10 miles north of Marquette near Thony Point. Uh, now, because this symposium is meant to celebrate the history of the UP, and we have one of our uh, celebrated uh, historians here, Mr. Magnani, um, I'd like to uh, first read a little bit from another celebrated historian, uh, Dan Rideholm. And this is from his book, Superior Heartland in Backwoods History. And <clears throat> these words come from a man named Hempstead Washburn, who spoke these words back in the 1890s. Uh, Mr. Washburn, like me, was born in Illinois, but he had deep connections to the Upper Peninsula, and in particular, and in particular, <clears throat> to uh, Marquette, a love of Marquette and, and the beautiful shoreline here in Marquette. So 150 years ago, Mr. Washburn said this, Lake Superior, the most beautiful body of fresh water upon this or any other continent is an ever-changing object of interest. Its picturesque shores, standing out in irregular grandeur, capped with pine forests, receding into the horizon of unbroken hills and mountains at all times and under all conditions present to the eye a landscape of insurpassable beauty. And then he concludes by saying, describing our freshwater coast, that Lake Superior is destined, Marquette is destined to become the Mecca to which thousands will make an annual pilgrimage as soon as its beauties, sports, and climate advantages become generally known. Well, these, these words ring true today. They were prophetic. Uh, the coastline of Lake Superior here in Marquette County is still one of unsurpassable beauty, where people come either as residents or as visitors to recreate to wander in the woods, to hunt, to fish, to kayak, to connect with nature. And it is this connection with nature that is so important because when we look around <clears throat> and we look at the lake and we look at the shoreline and we look at the coastal forest and we look at the animals and the plants in that forest, these are not objects. These are not just objects. These are part of us. We are part of them. We are connected in an ecosystem with them. That's very important. And I know all of you who love this land feel that way about it. Um, and then hearkening back to the words of Mr. Washburn in terms of describing the climate advantages of Marquette in Marquette County. Um, we know that we are living in a relatively unspoiled and beautiful environment. And that as wildfires, floods, droughts, ravage other part of the countries, that people are coming here. They're migrating here as to find a refuge from these uh, uh, untoward events. This has been well documented and it continues. Now, in order to meet that challenge and to preserve this precious resource and to sustain a vibrant economy and a high quality of life, not only for those of us who live here now, but also for those who are gonna come seven generations on, or maybe 150 years from now, we have to have careful planning we have to be uh, careful to preserve and conserve this precious freshwater coastal habitat. But that sustainable future 
and the quality of life it offers is now under threat. It's under threat by a corporate lobbyist from Detroit, the Michigan Aerospace Manufacturers Association, otherwise known as MAMA, who has proposed to create a heavy industrial rocket launch site on the shores near Tony Point. And how heavy, how destructive? Well, first of all, the industrial complex planned is gonna be built on 2,892 acres of wetlands. Hundreds of acres of that will be clear cut. That'll result in erosion. We have two nice pristine creeks flowing through that area. We have two rivers, the little garlic and the big garlic. This will have an adverse effect on that watershed. It will also strip habitat for uh, multiple plants and animals, some of which are vulnerable and threatened. And to give you an idea again, how heavy this is, this is not gonna be one rocket launch company. This is gonna be multiple. And we know this because uh, recently uh, documents have been released on the uh, rocket launch promoters website that confirms this. <clears throat> These will be multiple rocket launch companies using multiple launch pads, launching multiple rockets, some of which are as large as the 95 foot tall, 120,000 pound, of which 118,000 pounds are explosive fuel, rocket called the Firefly Alpha, which just exploded in August when it was launched at the Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. And speaking of the risk of explosion, we know from documents released by the county's own aerospace consulting company that this industrial use poses such a danger to human life that between six and 13 homes in the area will, be, will necessarily have to be evacuated every time it's launched. And if we apply the Code of Federal Regulations evacuation zone, this will probably also involve closure of parts of 550. And, you know, even if the rocket doesn't explode, and, and there's actually a, a risk of 20 to 25 percent of failure, even if the rockets don't explode and there are successful launches, you're going to have rocket parts falling as debris into the lake. And let's talk about the noise. I don't know if there, any of you have ever worked in a factory or, or in a drop forge, but you know what kind of sound that is. This is gonna be much worse. The sound from these rocket launch, rocket launches is so extreme. And the shock waves, the acoustic shock waves are so great that at each launch, thousands of gallons of water are deluged in a water deluge suppression system around the flame at the base of the rocket in order to keep those shock waves from rebounding and knocking the rocket off of the pad. That's how heavy industrial it's gonna be. And what about sight and light pollution? Again, we know from the documents released by the corporate promoter of this, that there's gonna be a four 150 foot lightning towers erected there. <clears throat> Uh, it'll be quite a view for the kayakers uh, who go up the Hiawatha Water Trail. Um, and one of the prior uh, speakers, the one who was giving us all the history on the various Air Force bases, uh, uh, confirmed what we have read in, in the documents released by, by the rocket launch promoter, that it's not just maybe 20 launches a year. But the projection is that when combined with the horizontal launch site in Lower Peninsula above Saginaw Bay, that there's gonna be a hundred launches per year. Well, we know from our weather here that uh, uh, probably most of the many launches here in Marquette County are gonna be concentrated in the nice weather. And in that nice weather, that's when people like to go out well, even in the, even in, we love the snow, right? We go out anyway, in snowshoes, whatever. But a lot of people who come here 
And a lot of people who recreate here like that nice weather to go out. This launch site is gonna be within one mile of the mouth of the Little Garlic River, which as many of you know, provides world-class trout fishing. It's gonna be right next to the Hiawatha Water Trail where many people from Marquette to Big Bay kayak. You'll be able to spit on these rocks. Uh, that's an exaggeration. Well, it's within one mile of the Elliott Donnelly Nature Preserve. And if any of you have hiked up the beautiful trails along the cliffs of the Little Garlic River there, uh, you can imagine uh, what a disruption uh, this and an impact these, this industrial use, this rocket launching is gonna have there. It's right uh, within a mile of the uh, end of the uh, North Country Trail at that point. It's within two miles of the Nokamanon Trail Network at Sox Head Lake. It was within three miles of those beautiful sandy beaches that stretch from Little Presque Isle up north, to the other sandy beaches of the Superior Watershed Partnerships Coastal Community Forest at Eagle's Nest. It's within four miles of the tranquil overlooks at Harlow Lake. And it's within three miles of the quiet granite cliffs of Echo Lake. Echo Lake will have, a, will, that name will take on a new meaning with every booming launch. So why, you ask? <laughs> what, 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 what is so obscene about this is that there is no need. There is no need for this. This rocket launch promoter has been a lobbyist for many years. And finally, in 2018, they convinced the <clears throat> legislature in the outgoing lame duck session of uh, Governor Snyder's administration before Governor Whitmer took office of granting them two and a half million dollars to promote this idea. And the driving impulse, the driving idea behind this was that we need to launch these rockets to put these little satellites up in the air so they can provide GPS for all the driverless cars we have in Michigan. Well, I, I don't know. I looked around the parking lot today. I didn't see one driverless car. And in fact, the only driverless cars in Michigan are one or two experimental uh, uh, cars, maybe at the University of, of uh, Michigan, Ann Arbor. And in the whole, whole United States, there's less than 2,500. And AAA has done studies, surveys every year since 2015. And the last one done in 2021 shows that 86% of the American driving public will not get in a driverless car. And the trade magazines, if you read them, <clears throat> even if this does become a reality of driverless cars, which is doubtful, it will be 30, 40 years in the future. But let's assume that we need, the, <laughs> we need satellites for driverless cars. We don't need to launch rockets for those satellites off of the shores of the largest surface area of freshwater in the world. Because? because there are excess number of other launch sites in this country and around the world that can do this. For example, one of the companies that's been touted as coming here to launch, a company called Rocket Lab, received the license in 2016 to launch one rocket every 72 hours for 30 years. That's 120 rockets a year. Well, guess how many they've launched in 2016? 21. Three of those have been failures. Why? Because there's no demand for it. Kennedy Space Center just completed half of a launch pad, pads complex, that's gonna be able to launch 104 of these a year. None have been launched yet. Kodiak Island up in Alaska, grossly underused. So, <laughs> There is excess capacity and underuse. There is no need to spoil this land, this shoreline, this lake with an industrial, purely commercial rocket launch site. 
So what to do? What can we do? Well, now is a good time because we know from our Freedom of Information Act documents that we've obtained from the FAA, as well as personal conversations that we've had with executives at the FAA Office of Commercial Space Transportation, that currently MAMA is concentrating solely on getting a permit during the pre-permit process for the horizontal launch site in the lower peninsula. Now, from the documents we, that we, they've released, we know that their plans are very advanced for the vertical launch site. <clears throat> so while we can't be lulled into any uh, complacency by it, at least we have a little breathing room now to organize, to spread the word, to raise public consciousness. Our group is, has currently retained a couple experts in a couple different areas to help us build the building blocks here for a cogent and persuasive argument when the time comes when they may apply for a license. And you know, uh, you'd be surprised. <clears throat> you start talking about this and you start uh, engaging people and people are, are very interested in this. We have response and supporters, not only from Marquette area, not only from the Upper Peninsula, from the Lower Peninsula, from as far as away as Boston, other parts of the country, the National Park Recreation Association, which is part of the National Park Service, without even us soliciting them, reached out because they were concerned about the impact of this would have on the beautiful, precious resources we, we have here and have become a supporter. Other environmental groups has, have also supported this. So, You can go to our website, stoptherocket.com. You can get some information. You can sign up for our newsletter or for our news blurbs that we send out occasionally. You can get involved. And there's been tremendous involvement here in the, in the local community. Many local businesses now are passing out our Stop the Rocket signs and our pamphlets, our informational uh, material. We want to thank Bodega. We want to thank UP Art Gallery. We want to thank Gathered Earth. We want to thank Lakeshore Depot. We want to thank all those other environmental organizations like the Upper Peninsula Environmental Coalition. Yellow Dog Watershed Preserve that have stood beside us and supported us in this. So I guess I wanna leave you with this. This is not an abstract issue. As we see the world changing before us, and, and you know, I'm, I'm 75 years old, so statistically I'll be, I'll be dead in 10 years. So <laughs> maybe, 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 maybe sooner, right? But, um, but we have an obligation, right? Not only to ourselves, but to the future, to the children, to the grandchildren, to theirs and theirs and theirs and theirs. To preserve this ecosystem because it's a matter of survival of our species. It's a matter of survival of our economy. It's a matter of keeping the quality of life that makes this the best place in the world to live. Thank you. Okay, I would I always have to make a comment. I do wanna make a comment <clears throat> that talking about the beauty of, of the Upper Peninsula, Lake Superior and so on, back in 1847, the uh, commander of Fort Wilkins up at Copper Harbor, uh, made a plea at that time to keep the trees around the fort. And uh, it's really an environmental plea, at, I thought, at a very early time, 1847, so that people in the future could enjoy the, uh, the beauty of, 
uh, of the area, kind of untouched. And then later on uh, in the 19th century, uh, Robert Roosevelt, who was a tremendous fisherman, uh, came to the UP and he writes a book on uh, fishing in, in Lake Superior, it goes into tremendous detail. And uh, his book could be used as a, a promotion by uh, uh, Pure Michigan and so on, uh, or the Chamber of Commerce, as we used to uh, talk about, about the, the beauties and the wonderful fishing that you had in Lake Superior. And then from 16, uh, the 1600s on, uh, you had people uh, promoting pictured rocks. Uh, and uh, pictured rocks was considered one of three beautiful places to visit in the Eastern United States, Niagara Falls being one, and uh, um, the uh, area above Washington uh, in, the, in the mountains uh, being the second one. And the third one was uh, pictured rocks, if you could get there, they said. <laughs> this is when you, you came by, uh, by canoe. Uh, so that's kind of, that's an ongoing, people have had this ongoing a concern about the beauty and the wonders of, of Lake Superior. So this is a good to hear. I do have a question. I heard that, and I, and I always hear these stories when people want to come in, that supposedly this project is going to bring something like 40,000 additional people or maybe jobs or something. Could, could you comment on the number of jobs that supposedly will be coming with this project? You know, thank you, Russ, because I scribbled the word jobs on my outline here, but I forgot to mention it. And uh, that was something that was mentioned in the uh, presentation, the first presentation here today about the, the, the jobs. <clears throat> yeah, so uh, originally, uh, when uh, the public thought that there would be a horizontal launch site at K.I. Sawyer, right? That was what was public, but behind closed doors, something different happened. We know that. And if you want to go to the website and take a look at the bait and switch behind the Granite Loma plan, yeah, we, we've got that documented. <clears throat> but at that time, yes, 40,000 jobs, the, 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 uh, the salesman from MAMA said. On May 5th of this year, uh, the CEO of MAMA appeared before our county board, virtually by Zoom. I, I was present virtually by Zoom, as many others were. And um, Commissioner Corkin asked him, you know, how many jobs is this going to bring in? Well, you know, by 2023, we think there's going to be 650 jobs. Well, let's see, 40,000 minus 650 is 43 something or other, right? So something got subtracted there. Right. And then Commissioner Corkin said, well, are those jobs going to be here in Marquette? And uh, the CEO of the rocket launch promoting company said, uh, no, uh, there'll be direct and indirect jobs spread throughout the state. Well, the story behind that is this. For a vertical rocket launch site, like the one planned at Granite Loma, there's two factors. One is we know that similar sites like the Kodiak, Alaska site only requires five people to launch a rocket. And that, that the company that launches up there is a company named Astra, which is also one of the companies that's being promoted to come here. That company flies those five in from California and then flies them back. To Long Beach, right? So, and we know from the documents recently produced by MAMA that one of the promoting uh, things for the space companies, forget about the public now, now they're talking about space companies, uh, uh, to get funding actually, is that, you know, um, these vertical launch sites for these, this class of rockets here have to be uh, just very simple so the companies can come and go. Well, that's right, it's gonna fit in with that very minimal base of people that are gonna be required to launch the site. Will there be jobs? Yeah, there are gonna be jobs for people who clear cut the land, who pour the concrete, but after that's done, 
All you're gonna have left is custodial and maintenance, and that's about it, and maybe security. But there's not gonna be all these jobs. <clears throat> so that's a, that was a, a, a false over, let's, let's put it kindly, that was an exaggeration <laughs> on the part of the uh, uh, rocket launch people. Yes, sir. Yes, Denny, you mentioned um, that if this were to be developed, then the site um, area surrounding the site would be closed at the time of launches. So how would um, people who own land or use recreational areas like the Donnelly Wilderness be notified and would any compensation be provided to the landowners um, who couldn't use their property? You know, I, I don't know what kind of uh, response the rocket launch promoter would give to that, John. But uh, I do know that at the county board meeting, when asked about evacuation, the CEO of the rocket launch promoting company said, well, you know, uh, we're not exactly certain where this, the pads are gonna be located. And um, we're not sure exactly what homes are gonna to have to be evacuated but we'll be very transparent about it when it happens. Well, and that's his words. We'll be very transparent about it. Well, that's cold comfort, isn't it? Yeah, I don't know how they're going to do it. I, you know, I mean, um, up in uh, Kodiak, Alaska, uh, they do have a system where they block off the roads, send out alerts. Uh, and uh, so, I, you know, I'm, I'm not, <clears throat> I don't know. But we know from the Code of Federal Re Regulation requirement of 7,300 feet of evacuation zone, <clears throat> that if they apply that, part of 550 is gonna to have to be closed. And we know that up to 13 homes will have to be evacuated. But even if we go back to the uh, County of Marquette's uh, engineering, aerospace engineering firm, they, they, they said, well, six homes. Well, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's, not, that's not too good, is it? Somebody tell you to get out of your house because we want to launch some rockets. So for the driverless cars. I got a couple of questions. Do you, do you know what happened with that Tesla that crashed on the road to Big Bay? Was that self-driving or, you know? I'm sorry, I, I do not know the answer to that. Sir. Yeah, I heard it on the news, but then it doesn't tell you why. As far as the self-driving cars, um, that's a bunch of bunk because one thing, they got rear-ended because they stopped too quick when somebody was on their, you know, it's like, when do you run a yellow light because somebody's on your butt, you know, and when do you not? And these four-way stops, they have trouble because they can't read, you know, the other driver's intentions. And with a policeman flagging or trying to redirect traffic with an accident, they don't, they can't register that. So I see a lot of trouble with these self-driving cars. Until they can get all the bugs worked out of it, they ought to admit they don't have the answers. Thank you. Well, that's, that's a good point. And there's been so many safety questions with them. But I mean, what, what, one of the things is that people don't seem to realize the unintended consequences of having driverless cars. Because the effective driverless car concept is not individually owned cars. It'll be fleets of cars owned by a corporation. And if you want to go somewhere, you call up and they'll come pick you up and drive you somewhere. Well, I don't know how many Michiganders are willing to give up their pickup trucks <laughs> or their SUVs or their Toyotas or whatever they drive. I don't think that's going to happen. And how many people are going to be put out of work how many truck drivers? How many delivery people? So this is such a pipe dream. This is such a bunch of snake oil. I mean, when I heard this, I, th I saw the, the picture of the old guy in the Wizard of Oz movie in his little horse-drawn carriage selling that snake oil, because that's what it is. Yeah, I'm just interested in your hypothesis. What would happen if the citizens did not do anything? That's just a hypothetical question, but I'm curious. 
so you're asking me if um, we all decide to go home today and forget about that this talk and for, and wipe from our minds like uh, the men in black. We'll, we'll put a little light here and we'll all forget about uh, what had just occurred. Well, <clears throat> then you're going to see this lobby group put together a consortium of rocket launch companies. They're going to come in here and they're going to ruin our environment. And then you're going to wake up and you're going to say, my God, is this a nightmare? I try to describe some of the bad effects of it. And that's what's going to happen if we don't do something and organize to stop this. And we can stop this. And I want to put a shout out to the good people of Paul Township. Because in order to create this rocket launch site, not only will the rocket launch people have to apply for and obtain a permit to rezone this to industrial, they will have to actually convince the good people of Powell Township to amend their zoning ordinance to redefine what industrial means, because there's no heavy use like this described currently in, terms, in the Powell Township zoning ordinance. And if you take a look at the uh, material I sent out and go to our website, <clears throat> you'll, you'll get, there's a, a letter writing component. And the, and the, the officials in Powell Township, Powell Township government have been very, very good stewards of the environment and they're to be uh, congratulated for that. And we want to support them in continuing to maintain that good stewardship and ask them, write to Darlene Turner, write to Phil Moran, write to Sven Gonstead, say, thank you for keeping this pristine and please do not rezone this to allow this land to be spoiled. Dennis, my question is if the, you were kind of touching on it with the zoning is, um, because that's what I've been encouraging people to do is, you know, hey, contact Powell Township, talk to them about the zoning issues. My concern is, and maybe you can answer this for me, if they change the rezoning for that area, does that mean all like, then somebody can come in in a different property and say, we want to do, you know what I'm saying? That it's not specific to Granite Loma, it's to the whole area. If, if that uh, 5,000 acres, uh, actually 2,832 acres are rezoned for this type of heavy industrial use, any adjoining area there then is subject to the same kind of heavy industrial zoning. Because one of the things in zoning is, uh, well, uh, is your request for rezoning, would that be compatible with existing land use, adjacent land use? Well, if you're, if, if you're trying to put a, uh, a Walmart or a drop forge or uh, whatever, something, something very intrusive uh, next to this rocket launch site, you're going to have an easy, easy time. And I'm assuming with that different zoning that then they don't have to they're just like, well, okay, so we have the zoning we want. So now we can kind of, we don't have to run this by any committee now. It's already been run by committee. So if we want to kind of change what we're doing here, we don't necessarily have to ask permission because they have that zoning. You know what I'm saying? Like, instead of it just being like a couple launch pads, now they're adding another launch pad here and another launch pad here. And they don't have to say, hey, can we add another one? Because now they have the zoning that they want to do commercial. And because it's a very private property, and we can't see what's happening off of 550, whatever it is that right. they're doing, that footprint continues to grow without asking permission because they already got it through the zoning. Is that how that works? Right. You're talking mission okay. creep. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly what would happen. In fact, <laughs> based on these last uh, uh, couple thousand pages of documents we, we, uh, we, 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 we learned from the uh, rocket launch promoter, mission creep has already occurred. Initially, they were talking about one rocket one launch pad. Now they're talking about multiple, and, and that rocket was only uh, 59 feet tall. Now they're talking about a 95 foot rocket that has five times as much explosive fuel. So it's already mission creep before it started. But right, that's why it's crucial that they never get this zoning. And <clears throat> because they will creep, it will be a mission creep. Okay, well, one last question. So zoning with Powell Township's one issue. 
when does this have to go in front of uh, any environmental regulatory uh, departments statewide or federally? Well, uh, as I may have alluded to before, right now, the uh, rocket launch promoter is concentrating on a pre-application process before the FAA for the horizontal launch site. In that process, they'll have to do an environmental impact study for that existing airport. That's not going to be probably too difficult because there's already an existing airport down at uh, Escota Wordsmith above Saginaw Bay. <clears throat> but if they were to, and if they and when they start the pre-application process before the FAA for the vertical launch site, <clears throat> in that process, they will have to prepare an environmental impact statement. That will trigger a series of public hearings that will most likely involve the Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy of the state of Michigan. It will mo most probably involve the Department of Natural Resources in the state of Michigan. So there will be an opportunity then for public comment and public opposition. That's why now we are starting the process of hiring experts and we already have uh, a local uh, environmental, I mean, a local uh, zoning attorney. We already have uh, a very well-respected environmental uh, firm. And we're now starting to try to get some experts in different areas so that we can be ready for that public comment period. Okay, let's see. We'll have one last question. And then uh, uh, we can, you can ask questions when we're, uh, uh, when, when we're finished. Um, I, my husband and I, when we were in college, we snuck up on that land and we visited Grand Enrollment and we were just wowed. <laughs> but anyway, um, my question is, who owns that 5,000 acres? Is it still that billionaire or millionaire guy? Baldwin. Okay. Can't. I believe get, that's correct. Okay. Can't we get a, some foundation money or something to buy the 5,000 acre property? It, it includes the, the 5,000. Okay. Yeah, I think we're running out of time. There have been uh, some environmental organizations here in Marquette County who have proposed that. And uh, so far, nothing has occurred. That may be something that would take the consent of the person who owns the land, plus uh, some sponsorship by a local entity of government. But I see I'm being, getting the hook, so I'm gonna okay. go here. All okay, right. thank, thank you, very, you much. very much. Thank you. I say we all pitch in. Is there anyone? <laughs>